thank you very much for the invitation and for coming around. I want to talk about um, density of rational points close to manifolds. And I'm going to start with the question of rational points on algebraic varieties. That's where I came into this field from this point of view. In particular, about the dimension growth conjecture, I want to give a brief sort of account of what this is about. Then I want to talk to this about this more general question of looking at a manifold and rational points close to the manifold and explain how this has shed light on the question on the dimension growth conjecture in recent years. And in the last part, I will then outline applications of also some recent work, including of collaborators Rachel Shrivastava and Niklas Techner of mine, uh, to dive in an approximation. So let's start at the very beginning. If I take a projective variety, say given by R homogeneous polynomials with integer coefficients, let's start over the rational numbers Q for now, then I obtain a projective variety, say V. So this is zero set of my R homogeneous polynomials. Then some very basic questions that you may want to ask about your variety V is, for example, about the existence of rational points of course, a very deep and vast topic, which I'm not going to touch upon. But another question could be, if there's maybe infinity many points, how about a distribution of rational points on V? In terms of distribution, if you have infinitely many points, you may want to count them up to a certain height. So let's first define some height function. Let's say again, V is our projective variety. Let's assume for now it's irreducible and of a certain degree, say D. If you have a point in projective n space, say x in homogeneous coordinates x0 to xn, then we can always find a representative where all the coordinates are integers and co prime. There's exactly two such representatives on this plus or minus sign. You can change the whole vector. Then we define a height. It's a max of the absolute values of the coefficients. So this is well defined, and this gives you a what we call a naive height on there. So given we have the naive height, you may then ask the question, if I look at my variety V and at the rational points, and then I can ask how can we maybe count the number of rational points of height bounded above by say B, where B some parameter which you may envision going to infinity. In particular, I wanna talk about a question about upper bounds for this function. A first trivial upper bound is given by the dimension b to the dimension plus one. You can prove that by induction, basically by slicing, if you look at the affine cone. And we're going to look now at one concrete example here. So this is again the definition of the height function. If you have a point in Pn, the height is given as the max of the absolute values of the coordinates if they are given by a set of co prime integers. If we then count rational points on the variety Pn itself, then we want to count all such tuples x0 to xn, where the GCD is equal to one, coordinates bounded by B for all i, and we have to divide by a factor of a half because there's exactly two representatives, the vector and minus its vector, they give you the same point in projective space. So this would be a concrete counting problem. And you already see if you for now ignore the GCD for a moment, then for each of the xi's, we have roughly b or 2b plus 1 choices. So we should have something of order of magnitude b to the power n plus 1. And it's actually true the GCD only changes the leading constant. The number of rational points of naive height bounded by b grows like b to the n plus 1. This matches, again, our trivial bound to the dimension plus 1. So then dimension of Pn is a projective variety is n, so we get here b to the dimension plus one back. But this is not a hard theorem. You can also do such things over number fields and prove asymptotics work of Shannon But for us, this is now enough. And I want to reformulate it now for a moment into a, a linear subspace. Well, it's basically the same thing. I just uh, embed in a different way. If say V is a linear subspace in Pn given by one linear equation, it's non-degenerate, then the dimension of this linear subspace is n minus one. And by the same arguments, we get up to a constant b to the n points. So think about choosing x1 to xn freely, and then x0 is uniquely determined here. 
Linear subspaces tend to have many rational points. And you may now ask the question, if we assume that we do look at irreducible varieties, which are not a linear subspace, can we maybe get some non-trivial, yeah, some uh, upper bound or some improvements on that? Some, not improvements may be so wrong, but some stronger upper bound. If you move from a linear hypersurface to a quadratic hypersurface, yeah, say all the AIs are non-zero, say a full rank my quadric here, then one can count rational points of bounded height and you will obtain that there is a constant times b to the n minus one uh, points on there. I assumed here n at least four for safety because otherwise there may be at some point a logarithm popping up. This can, for example, do, be done by things like the circle method. And so a heuristic of how to arrive there could be that you say the xi's, they all have size at most b, they're all integers. So there's something like b to the n plus one choices for your variables xi. And this is a quadratic equation. So if the values were all, say, randomly distributed in the image where they could land, which is an interval of lengths around b squared, because it may be a typical value of this quadratic polynomial, if I stick in variables of size b, maybe size b squared, and if they were distributed equally on this length of size b squared, I would get maybe the probability of b to the minus two, that this is zero, this heuristic would lead to the asymptotic b to the n minus one. You can now do the same thing for larger degrees. So if we say take here degree d in a diagonal hypersurface of degree d, you can do the same, look at the same equation. And by the heuristic, I would now still have b to the n plus one choices for the coordinates. But a degree d equation, so say the probability of this, so again, equally distributed would be b to the minus d for one such sample choice to be a solution to the equation. One can actually prove such things for degree d um, hypersurface. This is true if roughly n is of size d squared, which uses the resolution of Vinogradov's mean value theorem due to again, Demeter and Goose in a general case uh, by Woolley. Um, previously on degree three and then also much general later on. I don't go and talk about the fine details here, just want to sort of point out that what it seems like if you look at this question from a naive point of view, that the higher the degree, what the less points you expect here. This is just an example of what one can phrase much more generally in terms of Manning's conjecture for rational points and varieties. If you read here this n plus one minus d and you think from an algebraic geometric point of view, you may say like hmm, this n plus one minus d is if you look at a canonical sheaf of p n that's o of minus n minus one, the cano and canonical sheaf of this hypersurface is o of minus n minus one plus d. So the anti canonical sheaf is exactly given by o of n plus one minus d. And this is exactly sort of this matching exponent. In other words, if you would use an anti canonical embedding of this variety, you would somehow normalize this exponent away. Sort of that is exponent is somehow related to looking at an anti-canonical embedding. That's part of what is formulated in Manning's conjecture for rational points on projective varieties of a number of fields. But we are not going in this direction. Despite it seems that the higher the degree is, the less points you have. This is all conditional on this varieties being nice enough. If we are given a variety and you don't know anything about it, maybe you don't know if it's smooth or anything, the worst things can happen. So this is a very simple example, but just to illustrate a point, if you don't make any assumption, say, look at this example, a hypersurface again in Pn, take some polynomials, should be homogeneous of the same degree, F0 and F1, and then look at equation X0, F0 minus X1, F1 is zero, that contains many rational points because I could set X0 and X1 equal to zero. So we produce a higher dimensional rational subspace on there. If you choose x0 and x1 equal to zero, the other coordinates are three. So you should expect b to the n minus points on there, which is again b to the dimension. And you can make the degree as large as you like if you have this sort of linear subspace contained or that kind of singularity which it reflects and you can't do better. Dimension growth conjecture gives indeed an upper bound which works or which um, tries to cover all projective varieties or Q of a given degree, at least two, no matter how singular they are. And the conjecture is that indeed, 
this example that we've seen on this singular thing and the same that thing that we have seen for the board week is the worst situation that can happen. So the conjecture is that if you have an irreducible projective variety of degree at least two, then the number of rational points in there is bounded by B to the dimension plus epsilon. So that matches this example because n minus one is the dimension of your hypersurface and also the one for a quad rack. It's called weak dimension growth conjecture. And you could also conjecture stronger things and also in certain situations, stronger results are known. There's for example here a plus epsilon. You could debate when this is actually necessary or when it should maybe disappear. I put here a V in the absolute in the constant. You could also here ask maybe there's some uniformity in terms of the degree or dimension of the variety. Both of this, there's some meaningful, or, yeah, there's work uh, results in this direction. So indeed, uh, Java versions um, exist in some situations. In the weak versions, already solved in Berber, Browning, his Brown, and Sauerberger using the determinant method. So that's a very, say, arithmetic approach where you try to locate your rational points in some auxiliary sub varieties and then try to intersect those in sort of by Bessou type style so and just get upper bounds in the end. Maybe just let me mention here along the way recent very nice work of Astrid, Klugers, Nguyen, and Dickmann, who managed at least degree at least five to remove the epsilon and get even here polynomial dependence in the degree. So not only a uniform result, but even a very explicit one. So this was an introduction of uh, one side where I think I got interested in this area. Instead of counting points on an algebraic variety, you could also try to count them close to a variety or more generally, you could yeah, take any manifold. I started you now just with a board which is not defined over Q. You may now ask here for integer points close to the rational points, which are close to it. This example by Oppenheim's conjecture where we'd get arbitrarily close to this quadric. But so imagine like instead of yeah, lying now on the thing, I want to have points close to being somewhere just in a, in a neighborhood. We can formulate this as follows. If we have some bounded set manifolds, they have dimension little m, that's gonna now stay the dimension for the rest of the talk here. Then we define a counting function, which comes with two parameters, first capital Q and delta. Q measures the complexity of your rational point, the size of the largest denominator. If I look at a rational point, say parameterizes it with P over Q, where P is an integer vector, and Q is a natural number of size up to at most capital Q. So this is just a fraction here of uh, an n tuple of rational numbers with which I've written with the same denominator. And you may ask now for points of this form, which are close to M. M is something bounded, so automatically then P will be also bounded by a constant times Q. And you may ask for the number of points which are close to M by distance at most delta over Q. So the delta measures how far you want to be away. Distance could be, for example, a Euclidean distance. And this Q is there for normalization purposes. But uh, in practice, this doesn't hurt much. So that basically is like taking a shell around your manifold and asking for rational points, which are close there. And that's closely related to the dimension growth conjecture, because if you take some algebraic variety and look at some affine patch and rational points on there, then the rational points on your manifold, which say comes from the algebraic variety, is exactly the thing which you would count here for delta equal to zero. So you kind of sign the thing up and look at what's in here. That's also a trivial bound. The first real other bound you could get is of size q to the m plus one. Um, we will say about this a bit more later. For example, if um, R1, if you look in R1 at an interval from zero to one, then I would count here fractions P over Q, one dimensional rational numbers, fractions P over Q between zero and one, and there's about Q square of them. This is what you see here. This would be a Q to the power one plus one. Sometimes there are that many points because you could, for example, choose as a manifold a piece of a rational linear subspace. Just the example we here, take some interval from zero to one and the line R1, and then we will find actually Q squared points on there. So this trivial other bound of Q to the M plus one is sometimes realized for rational linear subspaces. 
that's maybe not a typical case. Um, there's now an alternative heuristic that I want to draw your attention to. So for a moment, let's say M is the dimension of your manifold. R is the co-dimension, so N is the dimension of the ambient space. Then you could try to understand this problem as counting lattice points. You could now imagine in this formula to first fix little q, that gives you capital Q choices. Now if I fix this little q, then I look at somehow a shell around M of, well, signed up by delta over capital Q, little q is of size roughly capital Q for now, for simplicity. This thing has co-dimension R, so the volume that I get by signing up my co-dimension R manifold by delta over Q should roughly be delta over Q to the power co-dimension. So this delta over Q to the co-mind dimension is the volume in a shell I look at. And in this shell, you then ask for rational points with the same denominator Q. That's a lattice. So you look at, if you fix that Q, do you look at lattice and it has the determinant Q to the minus M. So if you naively think about it, it's like take as taking the volume, dividing by the, the determinant of your lattice, you would expect in this shell delta over Q to the R times Q to the N points. And that's another factor of Q because we then in the end let vary Q. So if we calculate this, we get delta to the co-dimension and Q to the dimension plus one. So this is another heuristic that you may come up with. So uh, maybe some point before we go ahead, that rational linear subspaces contain many rational points is something special. If you take any manifold, which is not a rational linear subspace, similarly as in the dimension growth conjecture, you may expect that there's far less rational points on there. So you might expect that if there's far less rational points in there, then maybe if delta is somewhat large, this contribution is the one that you could maybe see you and exhibit. But even then, your manifold may still contain itself a reasonable number of rational points. There's just two examples. Maybe you can look at a second one for time reasons. If you take an n minus one sphere, that's one equation, say x1 squared plus xn squared equals to one. If you ask for rational points on there, then by dehomogenizing, this is the same as asking solutions to the equation, say y1 squared up to yn squared is equal to, say, z squared in integers. So again, this is like the same question, more or less, that we asked for a quadric earlier on. And if I set your delta equals to zero and count the rational points on the sphere, then you get back after constant again q to the power n minus one points. So you expect on the sphere q to the n minus point points, and if you compare that to the heuristic, r would be equal to one in that case, and m would be n minus one. So we would compare this delta times q to the power n. Then you see that as long as delta times q is larger than one, this heuristic term should dominate the points which are on here. So we may expect that there's some lower bound for delta for which somehow in this shell around a manifold is large enough that the, say this, um, yeah, heuristic expectation is the one that you actually count, which is larger than the thing, this uh, stuff that is going on on the manifold itself. And indeed, this is a conjecture which in this form has appeared in work of Yin Yi Huang. I'm going to come to that in the next slide. If you take a bounded submanifold of Rn, its boundary, its proper curvature conditions, this is actually right and it's supposed to be like that. Um, so it's a question in the end, under what conditions one can establish that conjecture. Then first of all, one can conjecture that is, there's a general upper bound, which cons consists of this kind of heuristic, of how many things we generically expect, plus a term, which is the same that we've seen in the dimension growth conjecture. This is Q to the dimension plus epsilon. And it's for the same reason here, because if you think about an algebraic variety, and then take an affine patch of this, say projective variety, and then take an affine patch, and then could consider this as your manifold M, then you may expect by the dimension close conjecture, maybe in the worst case, Q to the M plus epsilon points on there. And if you then very boldly conjecture, maybe that yeah, no matter what manifold, which is somehow reasonably behaved, has the same property that on the manifold you don't find more than these points, then sort of, yeah, you could say like this should be maybe all the contributions you see, the points on the manifold plus the thing that then adds up. 
you can of course then just compare those two terms. So if you look at those two um, terms, you see that as soon as delta to the r is larger than q inverse, so or delta is larger than q to the minus one over r, then the first term is larger than the second term. So you could conjecture that if delta has at least this size, you may get this as an, as an asymptotic delta to the r q to the m plus one if q goes to infinity. For example, if r is equal to one, we get here again the bound delta is at least q to the minus one, which we've seen in the example on the previous slide. And there are examples like in Markov that show that some curvature conditions are necessary even for every point. Like if you look at a Markov for d at least three, then the point one zero zero one, you have a vanishing Gaussian curvature, and you get that many points which you can stick in delta close to q to the minus one is going to be larger than what would it be conjectured. This main conjecture has been proved uh, in yeah rather seminal work by Wang in 2019 for the case of hypersurfaces, smooth compact hypersurfaces, with the restriction that the Gaussian curvature is bounded away from zero. Well, it, we need some constraint here. For example, yeah, rational linear subspaces we have, or we need to exclude for sure, but maybe also other things like the Fermat curve. And this is one theorem that we now have in this generality. There was lots of previous work in this direction. For curves, Huxley was obtaining upper and lower bounds, which were almost sharp. Then there was for C3 curves or C2 curves, depends if you talk about upper or lower bounds, works of Beresnevich, Dickens, and Villani, one in Villani for the upper bound, the first ones for the lower bound, and also then a work of one uh, for curves. So there's been a lot of build up in this direction, but this was really a very milestone result. And some very interesting consequences. And that's why I started the talk in discussing the dimension cross conjecture, that you can reprove the dimension cross conjecture for the varieties for which the corresponding hypersurfaces have a non-vanishing Gaussian curvature. This is because if I stick in, in this conjecture delta equal to zero, you get as an upper bound exactly q to the m plus epsilon. If you rephrase this language from the algebraic variety side to the manifold side, this is exactly the same thing that you talk here about. This is very interesting because Wang's work is a purely analytic work. You throw away all the algebraic structure and you only remember that there's a manifold that you work with. And so in contrast to the earlier proofs using the determinant method, this is very yeah, interesting that you somehow don't need any arithmetic structure, at least for a certain class of varieties. But something that I now want to touch upon for a moment is work in higher code I mentioned. Um, that a few years ago I was interested in together with Shintaro Yamagishi, uh, which then leads us to more general results. So a serious restriction is the cyber services, and we want to point out that one can do for certain classes more. If you say parameterize your manifold by R functions, so say I take a vector x, this is a vector say x1 to xm, and then I take R functions, this parameterizes a co-dimension R manifold in R to the M plus R of dimension M, maybe consider this thing locally in some ball. Then first step is you want to formulate this as a counting problem. We are going to throw in smooth weights to make these things better behave. This may look like that. We look at this counting function here. Um, we count vectors A, and set to the m and q up to capital Q. So this a over q is the first m coordinates that you're looking here for this x variable. And if I stick in for this x a rational point a over q, I want somehow that all my fi's evaluated at a over q are also close to a rational point. And that you can formulate by asking for q times f i of a over q being close to an integer. This notation double bar of alpha for real numbers the minimal distance to the next integer. So if q f1 of a over q is less than delta, for example, it means that q times the first function f1 minus some integer b1 is an absolute value less than or equal to delta. In other words, f1 minus b1 over q is less than or equal to delta over q. That's exactly what we were looking for because this sort of says that the coordinate here is also close to a rational number with the same denominator, little q. So with this, you reformulate it and asking 
for vectors a over q, which of these um, yeah, functions get well approximated. And here again, we see back uh, another, another, again, the heuristic, what we expect, how this may grow in a generic case. If I would drop the conditions of these functions f1 to fr, and if w is some smooth weight function, maybe think about just an indicator function of an interval for a moment, then we would have a q to the m plus one points that we count. So say little q runs up to size capital U and the others a run up to size q to as well. So we get q to the m plus one. And each of these integer parts lands between zero and a half. So the probability that you hit delta is something like two delta. And if these events were independent, we should expect that say a proportion of delta that R of the points actually satisfy these inequalities. And that's the same heuristic that we had earlier on. In the case of a hypersurface, say if R is equal to one and you're parameterized by one function F1, then non-zero Gaussian curvature is a, in a given point x0 is the same thing as saying that a Hessian matrix does not vanish at that point. The class of manifolds for one can extend this work of one, uh, which is most like a class. It's an interesting class, but one example where one can do something is um, asking for the Hessian in the whole pencil of functions that parameterize your manifold never to vanish. It's a rather strong condition. I want to point out that we ask this in a real pencil in a complex or complex numbers, it would not be possible. So we asked in a real um, setting about this. So think about your Hessian matrix and take the linear combination of those. Then if you compute a determinant, you end up, for example, with a power of a positive definite quadratic form in T1 to TR, that would be one example where this would be realized. And such examples do exist, for example, from results of determinantal representations. You can construct those. The nice thing is that one can yeah, prove again similar asymptotics and upper bounds. And the reason why I think this is a nice class um, or an interesting class, well, one reason is that this condition is actually not as um, completely, um, yeah, maybe random as you may think in first place, also an analysis of one of my co-authors, Vachala Shivastava, then later explained to me that uh, also over there, this is an assumption that sometimes, yeah, you may like to use. Um, but what a nice thing from an arithmetic point of view is nice that if we look at this class for which well, there exist examples, then we actually can count the number of points in a much thinner shell than we were conjecturing to. So the results that you get are actually stronger than what you would conjecture. So you would conjecture that only up to Q to the minus one over R, you can count stuff. But the actual thing we get is well, it's smaller, um, at least if the co dimensions yeah, uh, certain ranges. Well, even if the, something nice is, for example, if the dimension m goes grows very large and you actually approach delta as larger than q to the minus one, which would be the modest thing for hypersurfaces. Which I think is kind of interesting because very often in a dimension growth conjecture, you just project things down to the hypersurface case. And there may be, yeah, also sometimes on certain conditions more going on in higher co-dimension, which would be suggesting by this example. So if we the reason why we can count in thinner shells is that we can show there's less points on the manifold. That's why we can zoom in more because there's just less that could be disturbed the main count. And I display here the concrete upper bound. It's maybe not, yeah, we can talk about what this is. Um, the trivial one, or no, well, not a trivial, so this would be the conjecture Q to the M and we save some power. And again, if we think about the dimension M as being very large, you actually save an R minus one here. Uh, so for each code I mentioned, you seem to save, maybe you could, could save close to a power. But I'm not gonna, yeah, in the detail here too much. I just want to also maybe point out um, along the way of that it's not so easy to um, get away from the curvature condition that the Gaussian curvature is not equal to a zero. So in higher code I mentioned, even if this um, somehow make this much stronger, there's one very nice example by Rachula Srivastava and Niklas Techno where they can remove for one point uh, this Gaussian curvature condition, essentially, spirit. They look at hypersurfaces, it's so again of this shape, which are given by a homogeneous function. So say a function f, such that f of lambda x is lambda to some degree times f of x. You could think about something like an L2 norm to a power d as a concrete example. And they manage, yeah, so this, 
by construction, um, if d is larger than two, is going to have a vanishing Hessian in the origin. So you kind of construct examples that way that the Hessian vanishes exactly this one point in the origin. And that's the situation that I study where the Hessian otherwise is non-zero. And they indeed obtain here upper and lower bounds of the, the sharp uh, for the range delta q inverse. So that's the thing where you would want to study. And something very interesting here is that there's another term that pops up. In fact, the result also holds for capital D being larger than n minus one, and I would have to write it up slightly differently. So this is one say sample result. Something interesting about their work is that they actually show that if delta gets somewhat small, and if the degree D of your homogeneous polynomial is large, then mm -hmm. there is actually some other contribution that you're going to see from some kind of what you could call a cap set. So think about a thing, but just being very flat, your hypersurface, such that if you're zooming into the origin, that somehow you, you just behave sort of almost that linear that there's somehow many points in there. That also shows that you can't just conjecture everything to go through without any further assumptions and curvature, for example. So I really like this work a lot because it brings a lot of interesting tools from the analytic side and sort of bootstrapping arguments, which are um, very nice to have here. But of course, you may also want to go further and ask what happens now for even more general manifolds. So these are all very nice examples that do something in higher code dimension of a one point being, yeah, maybe exceptional, but what if you want to drop now basically all conditions in a way? Maybe you don't want to look at a rational linear subspace, we understand them, but maybe one of the biggest classes that you could consider are what is called L non degenerate manifolds. Would say that if you have some manifold, which again is parameterized here, say by R functions and X now again an M-dimensional vector. So this is an M-dimensional vector and R functions F1 to FR. You would say it's L non-degenerate if the partial derivatives, this vector of order up to L span Rn in a point, and you say it's L non-degenerate if this happens say, for all the points of your manifold. Concretely, this just means that your manifold is not contained in some linear subspace. If you think for a moment about a hypersurface, so one function f, then being non-degenerate means that there's just some derivative somewhere which is not going to be zero in every point. So it's really the weakest thing. Oh, sorry, derivative of or at least two. That's not going to be equal to zero. So in a way, it's somewhat a weak, very, very weak notion that you could ask for. And um, Something surprising that together with Rachel Srivastava and Niklas Techner, we figured out is that we can actually do something about that class. Formally, there's some counting function you would associate to it. Um, we will stick in even more smooth weights, even smoothen our denominator and everything else. But so think about this counting function here as the same counting function that we have seen previously. So this counts the rational points close to this manifold where the denominator is bounded by capital Q and you look in a shell of size delta divided by capital Q. And under this very weak assumption of L non-degeneracy, we do manage to get an asymptotic. It's the constant, the one that you would predict under that smoothing and delta to the R Q to the M plus one with some power saving in Q, as soon as delta is not too small, that we need a lower bound in delta is certainly expected. Um, this is most likely not a correct lower bound, but it's some lower bound. That's already very nice because I tried that. I uh, hope that I tried to illustrate a bit with the previous example. It's not so easy to just get rid of somehow, uh, yeah, the curvature conditions. So in this context, it's to our knowledge the first bound that gives something gives an asymptotic in that generality. Yeah, again, sort of this bound while well, it gets weaker, the larger dimension, co-dimension, uh, dimension, and, and um, embedding dimension, and also the non-degeneracy parameters. We can get lower bounds, which are stronger. For the lower bounds, we actually get here the same constant. So this constant, I raise it now here, there exists a constant, but what I really mean is we can produce a lower bound with the exact thing that you expect up to an error term, which again is power saving in Q as soon as delta is at least as large as Q to the minus three over two and minus one. There's been in 2012, a um, rather groundbreaking work of Viktor Perisnevich published in the annals in this case, 
um, where he produced similar lower bounds for non-degenerate analytic manifolds. So we could relax that a bit to smooth instead of analytic for delta larger than q to the minus one over r. So with that, for um, the case that our I mean, that sort of depends on the dimension, the co-dimension, we actually get a stronger bound with three over two n minus one. That's very nice um, because yeah, we sort of can produce in some sense now even more lower bounds and also with different techniques, we can do that. Um, there's also upper bounds. You can stick all of these things together that we've seen before and you get a uniform upper bound which incorporates the term that you expect and some well, um, maybe not so nice looking term, but what you get in the end, if you balance these out and think about what can be the worst case being, um, you obtain a bound for the number of points on the manifolds. So that comes basically from saying that if I make delta smaller, then also get less points. So uh, there's a certain point for delta where at both times you balance, and then this is an upper bound also for delta equal to zero, because there's only getting more points if I thicken this up. So there's a bound of the J D plus one. Um oh okay. Um ah, okay, minus one over two L D times n plus one. Here I made now here a yeah, I'm sorry about that. I will correct that in the things to be uploaded. Uh this is the dimension uh, plus one. This is an m plus one minus something. Um, so we don't hit a dimension gross conjecture with that, um, but we get some very general upper bound. If you would think about projective varieties, there's been some very nice work of Shota Nimoto, where he gets for projective varieties some upper bounds, though then you need to know something about the geometry, even to compute the exponents. And that's some nice aspect here that we get something for free. Now I want to say just a few words about a proof. We follow some, or part of our proof is inspired by work of Beresnevich and Young, which I'm going to get to in a moment. But the new part is using um, Poisson summation and introducing more free analysis into the thing. We use Poisson summation, we introduce things to studying oscillatory integrals, the main strategy. And using here already the language that Beresnevich and Young introduced of generic and special parts. In a work of previous work, you try to somehow look at your manifolds, and there was some, or that was Paris Nevis and Young introduced, there were some special parts which are hard to handle, which you have to somehow cut out and don't know what to do about with much very well, and some generic part where you can somehow try to get upper bounds. We also do something similar, but analytically, we construct carefully a weight function to do this. And then, so for the generic parts, we use even rapid decay estimates, a bit more in a, well, we have to be a bit careful because things depend on more parameters than maybe um, yeah, your standard application may be used to, um, but with careful bookkeeping, this works out. And for the special part, we use work of Bernie Kleinberg and Margulis, which already appeared in the work of Peres, Nevich, and Young, and quantitative non-divergence, which basically tells us that a set of the manifold where you have a point for which there exists some shift vector in a Poisson, um, some which makes this integral somehow in a way that we can't control that this volume is small. So basically tells you that there's not many points for which there exist shift vectors which are bad. And this work of Bernie Kleinburg and Margulis has already been also used in many contexts, but for example, in this work of Beres Neil Chin Yang. So for us, the new part is that we combine it with the free analytic side. So for the last 10 minutes, I want to discuss applications in diaphanic approximation. And this is where also the work of the dimension of Paris Neil, which has been motivated from. I start now from the very beginning here again, uh, by Dirichlis um, lemma, you can approximate a real number, theta, with a fraction a over q by at least one over q squared. And multidimensionally, if you have a vector theta one to theta n, if you want to approximate it with a fraction a i over q simultaneously, you can do that up to q to the minus one, minus one over n. You can also formulate that in terms of approximation functions. If you're given a function psi um, and a point in Rn, we say that it is psi approximable. If this inequality that a vector y minus a vector a over q 
an infinitor norm is less than psi of q over q for infinitely many such choices. So this infinity is supposed to be the infinity norm. So we want that each coordinate y i minus a i over q is an absolute value less than psi of q over q for all i. So for example, by Dirichlet's theorem, if you choose for psi of q, the function q to the minus one over n, then you get here on the right hand side minus one minus one over n. That's exactly sort of what you come from this multidimensional Dirichlet lemma. Then Dirichlet's theorem would tell us that um, everything has infinitely many such approximations. We can approximate every point that well. You may now look at other approximation functions, a very classical theorem in this area, Skinchin theorem, which basically says if I look at some monotonic approximation function, then there's a break of depending whether the series of psi of q to the n is convergent or divergent. So if psi of q to the n is convergent, which means somehow psi is rather quickly decaying, so I want a rather very good approximation, then un, which is the Lebesgue measure of the psi approximable points in Rn is zero. So if you want to approximate your point so well that is psi of q to the n is convergent, so then you make this very small here, um, yeah, then this is only for Lebesgue measure zero point at most possible. On the other hand, in the divergence case, the complement has Lebesgue measure zero, so almost all points are that well approximable. If you would take Kinchin's theorem and stick in again the approximation function q to the minus one over n, then we are in a divergence case. And so you would get that a complement has Lebesgue measure zero. So almost all points are that well approximable. Well, we even know better by Dirichlet's theorem, but I just want to show you that this is the normalization uh, which we can, which uh, pops up here. Kinchin's theorem is basic application of Borel Cantelli lemma, which I just want to recall quickly here. So we are in a case that this approximation function has this convergence. And if you then say, look at a cube and of the n-dimensional cube in Rn and the psi approximable points in there, you could ask the other question, if I fix a denominator q, which real numbers are close to a rational point with denominator q in this box 0, 1 to the n? So if I look at vectors ai over q, and if you thicken this up by psi of q over q, then you would look at such kind of, yeah, these are little boxes in each direction you thicken up by psi of q over q, and you would take the universe over all the a's. This would be then everything that, that would be a set of real numbers which are somehow close to one point with the denominator, little q. The measure of this thing is psi of q to the n because each little box has measure psi of q to the n over q to the n, and you have q to the n such rational points, denominator q. But the sum of these measures of the eq is convergent, and by Borel Cantelli, that means that for almost all points, you can at most slightly infinitely many of those. So the measure of those for where you're contained in infinitely many of these e sub q's must be zero. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. We wanted to say that for most points, there can't be infinitely many approximations if you're in a convergence case. So I'm showing this argument to you because I want to point out that what we use here is basically we are able to count rational points of denominator equal to q in a box. And if you now want to do approximation, not in Rn, but close to a manifold, that's where then the results of counting rational points close to a manifold come in, very much for that reason. A question has been phrased in different variations uh, different works that I name here has been a following that if I take a submanifold in Rn, and again a monotonic approximation function for which I assume this series to converge or diverge, then you could ask if also restricted to the manifold, almost all or no points are psi approximable. So imagine you take an approximation function for which this thing converges, then you know that in Rn, the Lebesgue measure is zero of the points that you can very well approximate. But it could be that maybe they are all somehow contained or that in your manifold, it could be that your manifold somehow behaves exceptionally, that despite an Rn, you can approximate that well, typically you can on M still, also the other way around. And so this question basically asks that, um, 
yeah, if I restrict to a manifold, does this does it still behave somehow the same way? Does a typical point on Rn behave like a typical point on a manifold? The divergence case has been essentially proved for smooth manifolds non degenerate by the work of Beresnevich that I mentioned earlier on, on lower bounds and rational points close to manifolds. And very recently, the convergence case has been proved by Beresnevich and Young, exactly using upper bounds for rational points close to manifolds. And the reason why you need here upper bounds for rational points close to manifolds is exactly that argument here by Borel can tell me more or less. If in total they are not for each denominator q or h of denominator q, if they are in total not too many rational points, then there can't be also a very large measure of real points which are close to these rational points. So this is a direct application. And with our work, um, we can actually reproduce that theorem. So our upper bounds that we obtain for rational points close to manifolds are stronger what is produced in there, maybe because we managed to uh, kind of not in the free analytic techniques on that side. That is not visible in reproving that theorem, but it's visible if you ask final questions in this direction. If you say take some subset and define dimension as the host of dimension and write this what host of measure hs, then you could ask if I look at some approximation function q to the minus tau, then for example, for tau is equal to minus one over n, this is what's covered by the theorem, the um, host of dimension would be n, everything rn is that well approximable, but if I make tau tau larger, so if I want to approximate better, then I know that the Lebesgue measure is going to be equal to zero of the things that I can approximate well, but maybe the host of measure is somehow still um, non-zero. You could ask about a host of dimension of the things that are somehow even better approximable. And in Rn, one can solve this in the work of Janik Vesikovic for large taus for just Rn, um, which again is sort of a very similar concept as to what you've seen in the in the um, Kinchin's type theorem. And you can now ask a similar question for a manifold. So if you take a manifold and look at the points which are very well approximable as n of psi, and you somehow want to approximate very well, can you still find the dimension, the host of dimension? And there's a conjecture or the question or conjecture. I will move to this slide. Um, this appears in Barry Stevens and Young as well. So they say that maybe by a similar heuristic of volume computation, so this is a very natural um, thing here, one can compute the dimension, the host of dimension of these very well approximable points for certain values of tau. And there's a certain limit where this may not work anymore. There's also good reasons for this. And one question is now, how large can we make this tau? Uh, so to what extent can we still understand the host of dimension? So the larger tau gets, the better we want to approximate the points. And so it's a challenge to ask like, how, much, how large can I make the tau? How well can I approximate and still um, understand at least the dimension of the things that are that well approximate? And given that we get stronger upper bounds by our techniques, we can improve on that aspect by, well, by something. Um, neither do the work of various Nevich and Young give the conjecture, nor of course do we, um, but a range of status values of tau, such that we can find a dimension that gets larger. There's different inequalities, maybe not so illuminating, but I just wanted to say that sort of information that we have on rational points close to manifolds gives sort of here information on uh, definite approximation. So I think now we are maybe just in time. So thank you very much.